Now, on the one end of this discussion, as I said, there's dualism, the idea that our body and our subjectivity and our experience and our mind are different, are, are fundamentally different things. On the other hand, at the other end of this discussion, there's a viewpoint called monism. The view and the idea that there's only one basic kind of stuff in the world. And often uh, monism comes together with the idea of physicalism or materialism, which is the idea that everything is physical. Uh, so from this point of view, your mind, uh, who you are, your experiences, everything that you're feeling can be reduced to a physical phenomena, which also means that we can study them and we can understand them. There's nothing that goes beyond our understanding. And perhaps the strongest incarnation of this um, uh, was written by Sir Francis Crick. In 1994, he coined what is now known as the Astonishing Hypothesis. And he opens his book saying the following. You, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. The idea is that everything you are, the feelings that you feel when you fall in love, the what it takes to look at something and recognize the face of somebody dear, the, the joy, your plans for the future, your fears, your memories, they're nothing but a physical instantiation. They all emanate from, the phys from physicality and from a specific physicality, your brain and its mechanisms. I have to say, um, today, most scientists who study the brain um, tend to subscribe to this hypothesis. Uh, so the view that intelligent behavior ultimately can be perfectly understood uh, in terms of the workings of the physical mind without having to appeal to anything that goes beyond anything metaphysical. Now, I don't expect you to believe me just like this in the span of two slides. I think it's a tough pill to swallow because there's, there's so much of our, our culture, as I said, that I think is deeply dualistic. Whether we truly mean it or not, uh, I think that how our, that's how our culture uh, feels. And I have to say, reducing who we are and our experiences um, to, uh, to physicality doesn't make it any less beautiful. It, it doesn't make the brain any less amazing. In fact, to me, it makes it even more amazing. It just means that ultimately, we can study them, our mind with the tools of the physical world. And if you want to get meta, how beautiful is it that the brain is studying itself? I find that to be extremely poetic. But let me give you two pieces of evidence that I think fall in favor of the astonishing hypothesis. Now, the first piece of evidence um, comes from uh, the mid 1800s. And it's the story of Mr. Finnis Gage, who you see portrayed here. Now, Mr. Finnis Gage um, at the time was a very highly regarded uh, foreman working um, in railroad construction. Talking about mid 1900s. Um, he was very well regarded, uh, very dependable, uh, very tenacious. Um, he hadn't studied, but he was very, very smart businessman, very persistent um, in following through with his plans. Now, one day um, he was uh, using a large iron rod. In fact, the rod that you see um, in, this, um, uh, in, in this picture. And he was using it to, to tamp explosive into little holes that they were drilling in, 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 the, in the rock in order to explode the rock and sort of to clear the path for the railroad. Um, now he got distracted uh, by a fellow worker um, who sort of diverted his attention to something else. Uh, and, and a spark um, suddenly ignited and caused the powder that was in the hole to explode. Together with that, 
the rod got propelled and launched in the air. In fact, it landed 80 feet away. But on the way to 80 feet away, it entered um, under his left cheek and exited at the top of his skull. In fact, I have here a reconstruction, a three-dimensional, a modern three-dimensional reconstruction of what it should have been like. And you can see how in the path, it's also slicing through parts of the brain. Now, very surprisingly, um, Gage, uh, a couple minutes after this, um, he was conscious again. Uh, in fact, he was oriented. He could sit up by himself. He even walked into the doctor's office and um, kind of cracked a joke to the doctor, which is in of itself already very surprising. Now, what was even more surprising is that after recovering from the several surgeries that saved his life, it rapidly became apparent that his personality had dramatically changed. In fact, uh, in the words of uh, Dr. Harlow, who was his uh, curing doctor, um, Gage had become fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanities, which he was not previously accustomed to, manifesting little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times extremely obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations, which he would forget right away and just turn his attention to something else with no regard. In fact, in short, as an acquaintance of Gage summarily said, he was no longer Gage. And see, this is what's so incredible of the story, because it really illustrates the unity between who we are, our subjectivity, and our brains. See, people can undergo very extensive change to most of their body. Think of... Um, you know, people who maybe because of an accident, they lose a limb, they have some kind of major organ transplant, maybe they, they undergo um, reconstructive or, or other kind of um, um, elective surgery that changes their body. And see, people can undergo um, massive change to their, uh, to their body uh, without really changing much in terms of their personality, in terms of their ability to understand the world. Sure, they might feel a little bit different, who knows? You undergo rhinoplasty, you might feel a little bit more confident and you might, you might face the world in a slightly different way, slightly more confident way, just to make a sort of a silly example. Um, but it doesn't change, you know, uh, again, your ability to, to interact with the world. It doesn't change your desires. It doesn't change your feelings. It doesn't change your goals in life you'd still be yourself. If you spoke to a friend, they would still recognize you in the way you think and the way that you face the world for who you are. Now, on the other hand, even a small change in somebody's brain, say because of an accident or a stroke or a disease, can radically change who you are. It can change how you think, it can change what, what you remember, what you desire, it can change your priorities and goals in life, your feelings, your ability to follow, to make plans and then follow decisions. It can turn you from a very responsible person to a fitful child. In the case of Gage, we now know that the rod just so happened to slice right through the part of the brain inside the frontal cortex, that is so crucial to maintain the balance between you know, desires, passions, immediate rewards on the one hand, and uh, planning, following through, the ability to, to envision sort of a delayed gratification and to maintain and, and follow through with long-term goals. So this is a beautiful example of, of, of the deep relationship, and I would say unity, between you in your identity and a physical part of you, your brain. 
So this was example number one. Example number two is Capgrass delusion. Now this is a medical condition um, in which due to a disconnection, a very specific disconnection between um, the visual system in your brain and the emotional system in your brain, um, somebody develops the delusion that the people they love have been all replaced by imposters, have been replaced by lookalikes. They look exactly like those people that you love, but it's not them anymore. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to either click on the link or click on the video and you can, um, I've embedded it in the textbook. Um, and um, you will see Villanor Ramachandran, Dr. Villanor Ramachandran, who you see in this image, arguably to me, the Sherlock Holmes of brain science, a brilliant mind, who's the person who understood that this very specific physical change inside the brain is the cause of, um, of the rise of such a complex mental behavior, such as thinking that somebody has been replaced by a lookalike. Again, demonstrating the unity between our minds and our brain.